I was crazy. I just started calling people and I sold a bunch of units. And I was called into the office of the owner of the company and he said, you're fired. And I said, what do you mean I'm fired? I just outsold your whole sales force. You're in the selling business, aren't you? Why are you firing me? The following is a conversation with David Hoffman, former president of the Hoffman Group, a real estate firm in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. The Hoffman Group has sold $500 million of beachfront property every year. And since retiring from real estate, David launched the Education Under Fire initiative, which worked with Nobel Peace Prize winners to defend the Baha'i Institute for Higher Education in Iran. He's also the president of the Raising Haiti Foundation and founder of Partners in Racial Justice, two organizations working to heal historical wounds. I'm Bashir, and this is the EBBF Podcast. And now, dear friends, here's David Hoffman. What happened at the University of South Carolina in Conway that led to you getting into Myrtle Beach real estate? Well, uh... I put together like philosophy and psychology and religion and all of these things. And it was amazing. And while I was there, I met uh, this wonderful uh, psychology teacher, Paul Stanton, and we became close. Uh, but, you know, and I, I started to panic, like I need to find some income. And he said to me, well, why don't you go to Myrtle Beach? You've got sales background and, and, try to get into like ocean oriented property. It's a pretty hot market. And, and I went and it's a long story. You know, no one would even hire me because the market was good. I, I say that it was a, a good old boy system, you know, very conservative. People were taking orders. I had learned in my estate planning business to follow scripts. I was almost fired there because I did very well opening doors initially, but I wasn't closing any deals. And I was one time called into the, to the owner uh, of the company, FM Financial's office, along with my appointed sales manager. And he sat me down and he, <laughs> you know, uh, Jim Brown was his name. Jim looked at me and he said, do you like your job? And they were, they were giving me a $3,000 a month draw that I would make up with sales. And they outfitted me in like a three or $4,000 at the time series of suits and where I would really look presentable. And they gave me, my manager had a Mercedes Benz SL, five or six years old. And I was drooling over that. They gave that to me so I would have the profile to meet with you know, owners of closely held corporations, I had all of these things for free. <laughs> and so when he looked at me and said, do you like your job? I said, yeah. He said, do you want to keep your job? And I was like a little bit shocked. I said, yeah. He said, well, you haven't been following the script we gave you. Like, this is almost 50 years ago, right? And I still remember if you were to describe in one word the work that FM Financial is involved in, you'd speak in terms of the word accumulation because we're concerned with the accumulations of the business owner's assets. I mean, I will never forget that. I haven't looked at it in 50 years. But he said to me, you're not closing deals because you're not following my script. You think you can do it better, and you are a fabulous cold caller, but you aren't getting it. You're just wasting time. You're going to go home, and you're going to learn the script backwards and forwards, I'm going to tell you a foreign language if I want to tell you that you'll learn it in. And you don't come back in here. You don't make a cold call. You don't do anything until you've memorized that and promise that you're going to use it every time you go into one of these meetings that you set up so beautifully, right? And I said, I understand. I went home and I worked on it for a week or two and I memorized it, got back in the field and you know, I became the top new agent that they had uh, out of a field of 500 new agents that had been with the company for three years or less. And I was in my third year by then, second or third year, I think. And I became the top new agent out of a field of 500 new agents in my third year in the business. And if I hadn't used that script, I would have failed out of business. I didn't know what I was doing. I was great at like getting people to see me, right? I would knock doors down, but I could not 
create relationship or get the data that was needed in the meeting because I wasn't using the what they called the funnel script. But when I came to Myrtle Beach, no one would hire. I mean, no one would hire me. I finally got hired by uh, the developer that had the largest inventory of real estate. He needed to grow his team. And they put me on the least of the three new product teams. It wasn't oceanfront. It was back behind another uh, couple of parcels of land, but it had a view at the time. The, the thing was, they didn't, they didn't tell us that one of the pieces of land in front of us had also had approval by the city. And when that was built, you, the view would be blocked, right? So when I got to uh, Myrtle Beach and I got this job, and I was running out of money, I said, I'm going to like, I'm going to call million dollar business owners in Charlotte, North Carolina, which was the main feeder market of all the cities to Myrtle Beach. And I had a great story because I looked around me. There were like a dozen sales. They were growing the sales force. There were a dozen salespeople there. They, I, they had experience. They had been there. I was a new salesman, you couldn't even get a salesman's license. You got a temporary salesman's license for the first year, right? And I looked around me. People were just getting ready for the season. This was the winter now. It was, uh, you know, it was January, February. Nobody comes to Myrtle Beach to speak of during that time. And people were getting ready, getting organized. And I looked around and I said, you know what? And the, but the product was out there. It was available. Nobody was selling. It was all three brand new major developments. I understood it was resort uh, management was the name of the company. They were the largest developer in the state of South Carolina, not just Myrtle Beach. They were huge. And uh, so I looked around and I said, you know what? And I had this product that was, it was the least of the products too. I started making calls, and this is what I told people. I said, you know, the season is not here yet, and I don't get why these guys are not, like, doing what I'm doing, but they're not doing it. And there's there's product available that hasn't been sold yet because everybody's waiting for the, you know, for the cherry-picking time when people will be here, they come, and I understand it's like taking orders. But I got to just tell you, if you want the best price, because prices go up, right? If you want the best price and the pick of the litter, you want the best positions, you need to buy one of these. They're, they're sold initially in reservation because a construction lender would not let you have a construction loan until you had, at that time, 50% sold, under contract, pre-loan approved, ready to go. And I started calling these guys, and I sold 12. They were like $79,000 units, right? They were second-row units, one-bedroom suites, uh, I sold 12 of them in just a matter of a few weeks. I outsold the entire 12 person sales force single handedly. Before we get to that, what made you decide to make the move from LA to South Carolina? Well, uh, I was a relatively young Baha'i. I was serving on the local spiritual assembly of the Baha'is of uh, Los Angeles, where I became a Baha'i. And the entire body, all nine members of the National Spiritual Assembly, came to Los Angeles to uh, first meet with the assembly and then meet with the entire Southern California Baha'i community in one of the large hotels there. I don't remember anything about the assembly meeting discussion, but I remember, I will never forget, the takeaway for me at the larger gathering was that there were too many Baha'is in LA. It was, it probably still is the largest Baha'i population of any uh, town or city um, in the Western Hemisphere. There were well over a thousand Baha'is at that time, and this was early 1980s. Too many Baha'is, they said, in LA, if you can leave, do. Go to other places where there are not very many Baha'is. And, um, if you could, you know, if you could just pick any place to go, go to Hemingway, South Carolina, which is a very rural part of South Carolina. But that is where the Lewis Gregory Baha'i School was. And the Universal House of Justice, the world governing body of the Baha'i faith, had just approved the building 
of WLGI, the very first ever Baha'i radio station in the North American continent. And uh, when they said that, crazy me, it was impossible, really. I said, okay, I'm doing that. That's what I'm going to do. Now, uh, I had a business, a young business that had been successful, but uh, I didn't like it at all. It was it was high end working with business owners, closely held corporations, making cold calls to them um, to, you know, break down the barriers, get through the receptionist and the executive assistant and all of that to get an appointment to go in and talk to them about death and taxes. The two things any business person doesn't like at the top of the list, death and taxes, and to get from them in a 30 minute interview, probably more information than their children have, maybe even their spouse, their net worth broken down into personal assets, insurance assets, real estate, and their business. And, uh, you know, I, I did well, but making those cold calls and, and, and talking to people about something they, you know, they need to talk about, but they really didn't want to talk about, it was not a joy for me. So part of my, you know, people want to say, oh, that was so noble of you to, it really, it, it was not really selfless. I really wanted to go. And, but it was also impossible. I had a home that I had been already trying to sell that was on the market in the highest interest rate time, probably in the in the, in the history of the nation, uh, interest rates were like 16, 17%. And I had had this home on the market for two years with four different brokers, six months each, six months, when I give them the term, they wouldn't sell it. They did not even, none of them brought me a single tour. Nobody looked at my house. And so it was impossible because I also said, I'm leaving in 30 days. Like I want to go. <laughs> so uh, within a week of making that decision, I didn't tell anybody, another member of the local assembly that I had known, uh, we were fairly close, who lived in the same, in Canoga Park, it was in the valley, which is still part of Los Angeles. He approached me and said, if you ever want to sell your house, I'll buy it. So he bought my house. And I had all of these trappings and everything, literally, uh, I was gone. I sold, you know, a high end car that I had all of those things. Um, uh, and I bought, I was, it was nostalgic. I found an old 1970s two tone Volkswagen bus. We were hippies. That's what you drove, right? Back in the early seventies or whatever. And, uh, I bought that. It was at, it was like pristine. I can't believe I found it was, you know, it was in magnificent shape and everything I, that I owned had been reduced to a single suitcase and two boxes that I put in the back of that van and traveled to, uh, to South Carolina. So that's how, that's how it happened. Best decision I ever made in my life. All right. We'll definitely have to explore that. But what led you in your life to the point where you'd, uh, you'd give up everything to move across the country? Well, I mean, it, you know, so in the Baha'i world, the idea of pioneering, which is kind of like missionary work, except it's different because you don't get paid. It's not like a formal position, but you are moving somewhere, either internationally or nationally, to further the cause of, of, of the Baha'i faith. And so that was a big part of it. But I, as I said, I have to be, you know, just brutally honest and say that I was also, in a sense, I was running away from a situation that I didn't love. And it was a great, you know, a great excuse to do it. <laughs> I have to be honest. And, you know, so like one of the one of the lessons that I've learned in that is how gracious and merciful God is like this, you know, one of the teachings of the Baha'i faith is the importance of being, uh, obedient to the institutions of the faith. This is very different than anything else that's that I've ever experienced in the world. And the reason for it is that the Baha'i faith, 
according to the scriptures, and it has thus far, those prophecies have been fulfilled. It's the first faith in history that will not be divided. There will be no denominations. There'll be no uh, sects. It will be one universal movement across the planet in every location, in every language. And it's extraordinary. That is what has happened. And the purpose of the Baha'i faith is to unite mankind. So it's important that that uh, you know, that that would be the case. So on the one hand, by going, I was obeying the institution. They were asking people that could to go. It was really crazy because it they were asking people that could to go, and I really couldn't. I mean, the trappings I had were impossible to get rid of, except they were all gone. They, 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 and by the 29th day, I had, everything was gone. The house, I think, still had to close, but it was, solid with a non-refundable deposit and all of those things. And I was on the road. And so, it, you know, that it was a two-parted thing. But God is merciful, I say, because it didn't seem to ma- Like, we're blessed, supposedly, in the Baha'i teachings when we're obedient and when we do those things properly. And that is an axiomatic truth for me. I've experienced it. Now, I've been a Baha'i for almost 50 years, come from a Jewish background. I became an atheist in my earliest days because I looked at the religions of the world and what they taught on the one hand and what people did through the centuries killing one another in the name of God when the very foundation of of, of the Judeo-Christian movement, you know, Moses gave the Ten Commandments. One of the Ten Commandments is thou shalt not kill. And we've been killing each other in the name of God you know, for ad, ad, ad nauseum forever. And uh, And I thought if that's what God has to offer Either he's crazy or he doesn't exist, and I don't. In either case, I want no part of it. And when I learned about Baha'i, there's no clergy. I was invited to come to a meeting it's called a fireside, where you know there's no, no clergy, so any Baha'i might be giving a talk, or the group might be sharing together. There's no dogma. There's no particular format. In this case, there were talks every Friday night, and I set out to just disprove this new opiate of the masses, as Marx called religion, this, you know, this going to be flawed thing and whatever. And I kept going week after week. I don't know what drew me back, but it just was compelling. And ultimately, I came to realize that what is done in the name of God is has nothing to do with God. Like if you look at the teachings, if you look at the lives of each of the manifestations of God, their lives were pure. They were selected to take mankind from one level to the next to to show us the teachings of God clothed, if you will, in the context of the times, right? And uh, we have managed to, you know, divide those things, to add trappings, all the stuff that we do, and that is what the problem is. It's not, the problem is not God doesn't exist or he's crazy. <laughs> the problem is the people. And when I realized that, I became a Baha'i, and I've been a Baha'i for nearly 50 years, and still learning. You know, we, it's this vast ocean of, of knowledge and vast ocean of teachings, and one of the principles is independent investigation of truth. Like, no one has the right to tell another person what their path should be, let alone try to coerce them, which I think we're living in a time right now where everybody's kind of trying to do that, right? But God, in his mercy and love and wisdom, gave us free will, and we make choices. That's the purpose of this life, is to make choices, right? We don't always make good choices, by the way. None of us are perfect, but then it's an opportunity to learn because, you know, the idea of hell can happen right here, and it's, there's, it's not a place, it's a condition. And, you know, what, what happens is we, if we misstep, we bring on ourselves, you know, every cause has a reaction, right? We bring on ourselves the reaction, <laughs> you know? You can't jump off of a 50-story building thinking you can fly and actually take flight, unless you've got one of those new flight suits that they have. But you can't do that without crashing to the ground. You're going to crash to the ground and die every time. Like, there's no way to, to escape the law of gravity, and that's true in terms of spiritual laws. We can't, and I think we feel that in ourselves, you know, when we, when we make a misstep, when we mistreat somebody, when we do something we know in our heart was not right, 
if we have a conscience, uh, then we feel badly. And imagine spending your whole life just reaping benefit for yourself, walking on everyone else. That's not the purpose of life. It's to acquire the qualities of God. And then passing beyond this realm of existence, we don't know what the next realm is like. It's not physical, uh, but we don't have free will in, in, in the next worlds of God. And so we have squandered the opportunities to develop our, our character here, to develop the spiritual qualities of God. That's the purpose of this life. If you're willing to share... Were there any moments for you where you felt that pull, uh, pull of conscience away from what you were doing towards something else? A moment, or it's a constant battle for me, a constant battle for me that is like the individual self that wants things to be a certain way or wants to have things, and n knowing that not everything you want you should have— <laughs> right? Things shouldn't always be the way you want them to be. It, I think it's a, I don't know about anybody else, but for me, it's a lifelong struggle and it's heaven and hell. Like when you pass a test or you do something in the world that is righteous and that moves the world in the direction you believe God's will to be, which in this day is nothing short of the realization of the oneness of mankind. So when you're doing that, and you feel the power of that, you feel the fulfillment of purpose, even in small steps. We're not going to ever be here. We're not going to be living when the oneness of mankind occurs. We know that's going to be way into the future, but that doesn't matter. We're making efforts in that regard. That's, the, that's what the soul ultimately yearns to do. And that the, the feelings that come with that are so joyous, I can't even describe them. It's just this sense of being in heaven, really, if, they, if I, I would imagine what heaven would be, it would be that consciousness, that feeling. And conversely, you know, uh, doing a thing that is just recalcitrant to yourself, you know, it's like, that's not what God wants. Doing something that, that you know, ticks back movement toward oneness, right? That creates a sense of disunity or whatever the case may be, that's not proper, you know, um, leaves us with a sense of remorse, okay? And I think that I can't imagine, like, having spent your life that way, moving to the next plane, and then realizing, I can't go back. I can't fix that stuff. Like, every day we have an opportunity to fix it now, but this is not uh, the reality beyond this plane. We can still progress toward the will of God, but we're told in the Baha'i writings it's through the prayers of others and the mercy of God. Like, I would like to be, to some degree, in control of the things I can do to move toward God. <laughs> you know, I don't want to give that up. What I didn't, I wasn't thinking about this at the time, but one of the things that I realized was like obedience to the National Spiritual Assembly of the Baha'is of the United States going to that place then being panicked by like running out of money that I thought I was going to have, being put in this position, led to it by this wonderful uh, uh, philosophy and psychology professor, Paul Stanton. All of that happened in my mind because of that step in action that I took. The National called for it. I went there. and But then I was fired. This <laughs> is a great story. Then I was fired. By, and I was called into the office of the owner of the company, and he said, you're fired. And I said, what do you mean I'm fired? I just outsold your whole sales force. You're in the selling business, aren't you? Why are you firing me? Well, apparently, I guess I, I don't know if I offended or, or she was jealous. I don't know what it was, but a middle manager, a woman who was a very good friend of the owner's wife, she complained about me. And apparently Roger's wife said, you got to let this guy go. And uh, he fired me. And I said, this is crazy. And then I was in a state of utter anxiety. Like I had, ar now they did pay 1% of the 3% commission upon reservation. So, uh, which was not typical by the way, but I was very fortunate for that because the 12 sales amounted to uh, about, a million dollars, 1% of that was $10,000. That was a lot of money for me at the time. So I was given that 
and then I was fired. And now we were coming into the season, right? I had done it in the winter, right? January, February, part of March, right? And the season was starting. It was like, oh my God, I'm not like, I don't get to cherry pick now. So I started uh, calling every developer of ocean property in Myrtle Beach and getting appointments with them and nothing, nothing, nothing. And then there was one situation called the Meridian Plaza, which was on the ocean front. It was a small building, narrow building, replacing an existing hotel that was to be torn down. And uh, <laughs> there were uh, 47 units in the building. I'm sorry, 94 units in the building, 47 ocean front, and 47 on the side. The building is still, of course, there. And uh, I learned about it, and I approached the... Uh, the guy who was developing it in partnership with a, with a very wealthy guy in Columbia, South Carolina, this fellow, Rick Sigmund, uh, had also left resort management because he wanted to do his own thing. And they had restrictions and all kinds of rules and whatever. So he left and he had taken an office, a single office, office space, 200 square feet or whatever in a, what were called executive suites at the time. And uh, so that's an office building that they furnish and they have a receptionist and they have a, uh, a conference room and a little kitchen and whatever. You get one space you pay a premium for because you get all these services and you don't have to take a lot of square footage. So he was there and... Uh, he was doing market research. He also was getting ready for the season. They were putting a office in the lobby of the, it was also called the Meridian Plaza Hotel, okay? And they were getting all of that ready and he was gonna hire five sales agents to sell 94 units, which was a lot of sales agents, right? Uh, turned out to be. And uh, he was also doing market research. He was very, organized. <laughs> he was doing market research in Charlotte. Like I was just, I was crazy. I just started calling people and I sold a bunch of units. He was doing market research, wasn't selling anything. He wouldn't sell anything till the thing was ready. Right. That was the mindset at the time. And he had this stack of cards like this, right? Like that from ads he had run test market ads he had run in the Charlotte Observer. And I'm thinking to myself, I made 12 sales, outsold a whole sales force cold. Do you know like the value of a lead that calls you and says, tell me more. I saw your ad, I wanna buy something. Versus how many calls you have to make cold to find the ones who would do that. And I thought to myself, this is crazy. Like. And I said to him, I said, let's start, let's get going. He said, no, I'm gonna do it this way. So as aggressive as I am, I don't take no for an answer, right? It's one of the lessons for your business people, but you have to do it with class. And I didn't always do it that way. I was young, I was hungry, I was scared. I think a big part of my success was fear driven. You know, uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, one of the great writers of all times, wrote one of my favorite uh, commentaries it's a single sentence. It may not even be a whole sentence. He wrote, do the thing and you'll have the power. Especially here in the United States and the Western world, we live in a condition of competition, of one-upsmanship, of I got to be right, you know, uh, uh, America first, me first, right? This whole uh, individual rights and freedoms that precede everything or supersede everything, which shouldn't be the case. And uh, I think because of that, we, you know, we, we oppress people, we've beaten each other down, right? Everybody, like we feel better if we make somebody else feel bad. It's, it's all happening at a subconscious level. I don't think most people are cruel, but this is kind of the condition that we're in where we, you know, we lose self-esteem and that's a sort of, unconscious way to get it back. I don't know what, how best to say that, but because of that, we're all in fear. 
because of that, somebody might see me, and by the way, this isn't true, okay? Somebody might see me and say, oh, look at him. He's got the power. Like, look what he's doing. When I get the power, I might do that. But here's the thing. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. You have to do the thing to gain the capacity, and that is how you attract the power. If you're waiting around, you know, playing video games or whatever we do when we're just trying to pass the time or fill the time to get the power, you're not ever going to get the power. You're going to get the power. Here's how you get the power, by finding the thing you can do and going through your fear. It's scary. It's scary to do something you haven't done before, right? But if your attitude is one, a young man said this to me recently, and I was so taken with a young man. He said, you know, I am looking forward to, to rejections, to getting more rejections than acceptances, because I, you know, I need to learn by those rejections. And this is somebody who hasn't even done it before. And that's like such wisdom uh, from a young man. It, it really uh, took me aback. And I think what a great space for anybody to you. If you believe that and act on that, you will be successful. You will find the thing I get emotional sometimes thinking about the blessings that I've had despite my own unwitting, you know, just just like some of us are wired up just to go through the fear. It's kind of crazy, right? But uh, I've learned this principle. What is, there's a, you know, an axiomatic saying that God helps those who help themselves. <laughs> this is one of the truest things ever ever spoken, because that is the thing. Like we uh, we don't understand what God is or how the powers that be really work, but we do know certain things. And one of the things I've come to learn is that if you have the right intention, work hard, and do the thing despite your fear or insecurity. I get emotional because it's really, uh, it's really mercy. You know, it's we don't deserve it. I don't feel like I've deserved it, but who am I to make that judgment? That's up to God, really. So I must have deserved it because it happened, right? And what was it's that beautiful. for you? That thing you were, that thing you were afraid of, that you pushed through. In this case, the fear of urgency, okay? I lost my job, I saw that I could do well, right? And I don't have a job, and it's the season, right? So I talk to everybody. <laughs> One of the things I teach my kids, like if you need something and you knock on a door to get it, you might get it. But if you knock on 10 doors, you definitely gonna get it, right? So if you want it bad enough, you know, that's my, that's my approach. I work with folks that are successful that don't believe that. They do it a little bit differently. But uh, that's, that has been something that, that has worked for me. So in this case, the fear of losing the opportunity to earn, which I needed to do, drove me to do that. And so in the case of Rick Sigmund, he told me, no, like, go home. You're an interesting guy. When I'm ready to hire five people next month, I'll call you. We'll call you. Don't don't call us. We'll call you. Right? The old audition thing, bl uh, blow off or whatever. But uh, I just kept going back to his office. I would stand outside the uh, executive office suite and wait for him to arrive. I knew about when he would come, and I would stand there, and he would see me again, and I would follow him into his office, and I'd make another appeal. And he would say, David, I told you, like, you know, you're really har you're harassing me now. I told you, right? Go home. Go away. Go talk to somebody else. And I came back again. 
And I don't remember whether it was the third or fourth time because he, he was very low key. Like he, he would let me follow him into his office and then he would listen to me. He was very polite. And then he told me to go home. On this occasion, I said, Rick, you're missing an opportunity. He was so frustrated. I'll never forget. He picked up the stack of leads and he threw them at me. He said, I'm going home. He lived in a nice subdivision, Briarcliff Acres. I'm going home to do my work. I could get no work done. You come in here, you harass me, and then I'm upset about it the rest of the day. I can't get anything done. I'm going to go do that. You do whatever you want. You think you can sell these things? You take Here's the reservation forms. You have whatever. And then I had the receptionist who also did mailings and things that was part of the deal. Right? So I had my own office. I went in. I got on the phone to the Million Dollar Directory owners and their top executives are also named there um, for, in Charlotte. And another thing that had happened for me is in my, uh, all of this is fear driven, right? In my fear, if I, talk, if I knock on one door, I might get something, but probably not, right? But if I talk to everybody, maybe I have a lot better chance. I still didn't believe it was going to happen. Right. They're not going to hire. I'm a I'm a first year sales guy. Right. I've sold 12 things. Right. <laughs> I don't really have exactly like a, you know, like a uh, a burnished record. Right. Just one could be a blip. Uh, but in doing it, something was happening that I didn't realize till I met Rick and the Meridian Plaza. I at that time, there was a new law in Myrtle Beach that had lessened the number of parking spaces needed for a one bedroom unit, which all of a sudden made the one bedroom suite the ideal developer product because it costs less money to build it, right? So instead of needing two car spaces for one, it was like 1.1 or something like that. And so everybody, that was like the hot thing. And that's what I had been selling where I was fired. That's all the things I was looking at were predominantly that. And I would go in and I would take my notes Here's the thing. Here's where it is. It's on the ocean or it's on the ocean, but it's on the side of the building. It's an ocean view or it's set back from the ocean. Here are the amenities. Here's the square footage. Here's the asking price, the initial price or whatever, or the current price. And so I had like I had become a, an expert at the value of one bedroom suite. Here's the location. This is a great location. That's an okay location. This is not such a good location. I knew everything about one bedroom suites and I did it in like in three weeks in my panic to like figure it out, right? <laughs> I didn't know what I was doing. It didn't matter. Cause he, he, he if, if I could imagine like God or the, what I what we call as Baha'is the concourse on high in the next world, like setting the stage for me. They're up there laughing <laughs> and cheering one another because I'm like running around like a chicken with my head cut off, but I'm following all the things I need for everything to work. It's not possible for me to think about this without such a sense of gratitude and humility which I don't always show forth, right? It's so powerful. And so I had created a sheet. And the thing about the Meridian Plaza, the reason I kept coming back and I said to Rick, I said, your prices are the best in town, like by a long shot. The side units were seventy nine nine. That was the same price I was selling third row. And all the amenities were oceanfront. You walked out of your door. It was the ocean. And you threw the alleyway that was protected. You had a very close view of the ocean. I was selling a product. And then, by the way, we found out that even though I'd been paid a third, the other irony of this thing is that that development that I was fired from never got built. And the reason it didn't get built is because the developer knew that there was another building to be built in front of it that had already been approved by the city. But we were salespeople. We didn't look at stuff like that. <laughs> and so the team knew nothing about that. But then all of a sudden it came out and that was the end of it. And so one of the things that happened for me is we were given the opportunity to talk to our clients and try to move them to another thing or whatever or to let the company do it. And I said, no, I'm talking to my clients. Like I don't want them to think that I knew this and that I was uh, complicit in that what I consider to be a complete deception. 
Like if that didn't come out, but later it happened, people would be very upset, rightfully so. They weren't told everything, right? And it's not public record. It hadn't been built yet. So I called, I are, by now, I'm jumping ahead. I'll tell you how I got there. By now I was doing the Meridian sales and I was calling people. I was doing the same thing done in Bradstreet plus all of these leads, right? That had come in from the Charlotte Observer. And at that time is when we discovered that they weren't going to do that deal. We had to give people their money back or whatever. So I called everyone and I said, I have something I have to tell you. I did not know this and it's just come to light. And I've left that company and I'm doing something else. But I have to tell you that deal isn't going to be built and here's why. So I said, you've got three options. One option is that company has some other things, which I can tell you about. The second option is you get your money back. No, no questions asked. The third option is I got the best deal in Myrtle Beach. And there were 12 buyers, right? Of those 12 buyers, nine of them bought in the Meridian. Nine of them. And three of them I gave their money back. So that's exactly the percentage as if I was paid fully on, uh, well, some of the units in effect, okay? Because, or really on all of the units because I made a full commission when those nine bought again. Plus I had the 1% that they never got, right? Because that was their policy. All the new deals, none of them were doing it. So that was like a, a, like a gift, right? It was just coincidence, right? Not co I don't believe in coincidence. I think there's, a, there's an order to things. But so, so he'd thrown the cards at me. I was making the phone calls. I called him at the end of the first day. I said, Rick, you're not going to believe this. I almost don't believe it. I just took three reservations on my first day. He fell out of his chair. He said, he came to see, like, I don't believe you. He came to the office to see. And then for the next six days, for the first seven days, I sold an average of three a day. I took 21 reservations. He couldn't believe it. Like, that was more, if you've hired five people, 21 times five is over 100. There were only 94 units in the whole building. So that means the whole thing would have been sold out in less than a week, which he didn't anticipate. But I had a great story. First of all, you better get it before he opens his office, like I was telling before. And second of all, I created a grid showing everything somebody would want to know about an oceanfront one bedroom. Square footage, price per square foot, relationship to the ocean, total number of amenities, quality of location, all of those things. I had a grid, man, and I shared it with them. I, I said, let me overnight this to you along with the reservation agreement, but you're in, right? If what I'm saying is true, yes, I'm, and then it was done. And so in the first 10 weeks, I had single-handedly pre-sold the entire building. 94 units required 47 uh, sales. And I had 47. By then, we converted to contract. I had 47 contracts. Didn't need five guys. And I was going to stay on. It's a whole other story. I was going to stay on. But the developer had been approached by another developer that had two properties. The market was now slowing down. This was 1984. Congress had announced that they were Putting, it hadn't even been law yet. They were going to gut the, you know, it's all political, right? They were going to gut the tax benefits of investment property. Huge tax benefits. And when they said that, the market died. And everybody started getting into trouble. It's the best thing that ever happened for me. But things slowed down. They weren't selling. And this developer came to, uh, came to the Meridian developer and said, listen, we have, you know, we have Xanadu 1 and Xanadu 2 and North Myrtle Beach. They were two and three bedroom, beautiful units. They had pre-sold enough to get the thing moving and get it under, you know, uh, get the construction loan and start building it. But the market had died. It was worse for Xanadu 
Three, because it was not as far along. There were lots of units in the building and some units in Xanadu too. And they had heard that Meridian had just done so well. And they wanted to know if they, they were going to fire Century 21 that had the units, hadn't done very well. And they were going to hire uh, this new company, this company that was doing so well with its own development. And instead of saying, hey, I, here's why we did well. Here's a guy that picked up the phone and made calls when nobody else would. He put a whole program together, right? He said, oh, yeah, that's us. We're doing a great job and whatever. And he hired another guy. Uh, who and made him made him my manager, and I I was like floored by that. It really upset me. But then I I took a couple of weeks off. The market had slowed down, and when I came back, I learned this manager who got a one percent override on everything that I sold. I had had a couple of phone calls, several phone calls, people who were interested. They were coming to town, this or that. Two of them came to town. They came to town because I presented. Okay, on the on the new property, I presented this. We we had advertising just for that. This great story, and so two people came, and this guy closed them. Didn't tell me. I discovered it by accident. He skated me. He took my deals, like as a manager, he should have just closed it. Took his one percent. That would have been the courteous thing to do. In the, in the worst case scenario, if he wasn't a manager, he might have taken 50% of the commission because I was the front end. Always the front end gets at least 50%, and he was the back end, right? But he should have given me the entire commission. He gave, he was, his intention was to give me nothing. So I quit, and I left. I ended up, it's a long story, I ended up working for a Hilton Head company that sent me to to New Jersey, Upper Saddle River, where Richard Nixon had a home, leased for me a prop, leased for me a, a home, where I off uh, off property sold a Poconos Tam, a property that Wayne Newton had bought called Tamament. Right, that's a whole other story, but that project ultimately didn't go as well, so I went back to Myrtle Beach, and when I went back to Myrtle Beach. The developers that had hired Meridian that skated me, right, they, fe they learned that I was there. Like, they knew the whole story by that. And they came to me. I was, like, out looking and trying to figure out what I was going to do. They came to me and said, David, we would like to hire you because as a developer, you didn't even need – the salespeople didn't even need a license. So they – they said, we would like to hire you. We know why Meridian did well. By the way, from the by now, like three months, four months later, we'd had 47 sales. This new manager that skated me had made a sum total of zero sales. There were only 47 units left in the building. There were 47 units left in the building. So I, I said, okay, but I, I wanted to have my own company. And so I did something crazy. I called the real estate commission. I asked to speak to the real estate commissioner. I don't know if, the, if I talked to him or I talked to his assistant who got to him. Long and short of it is my story was, listen, I sold 47 units. I sold 12 units before that. I have a wonderful opportunity here and the market is struggling. It needs people who can sell stuff. It's a problem in South Carolina. And you're the commissioner of it, okay? I would like to propose now to after your first temporary year, you can only sit for a permanent license. You got to go through the tests and all of that. And three years or five years, I don't remember later, after that stage, you can get a broker's license. You have to go through tests or whatever. I said, I think you should let me. He said, Come to come to Columbia and talk to me. I told him what I wanted to talk to him about. Went to Columbia, we sat down, I said, because of my success and how many units I've sold, I think I've sold more units than the rank and file of agents sell in three years. So I've maybe not on time, but on experience, I think you should let me become a broker, not go to, and then I can have my own company. Otherwise I could not do that. I could still have worked for them, but I, I wanted my own company. And he looked at me and he said, I'm going to waive that requirement. 
you have to pass the broker's exam. So I took a class, a crash course in that, got my broker's license after a year, single year. <laughs> you know, that is also like another thing that I try to tell my, I've always told my kids, like this is a world we're living in where everybody is, not everybody, but so many people are self-serving them, you know. And here's what I know. Like if you don't ask for something you want or need, Nobody's coming along to saying, oh, can I give you this thing? I didn't even know you needed it, but here, can I? That's not going to happen. So be respectful, be courteous, but ask for what you want. Ask for what you need. It's okay. There's nothing wrong with that, right? And that's what I had done. So I'd say that's another, you know, that's another uh, thing to do, right? Um, so... I think it's a long, you know, way to say to you that I count the obedience to the institution and going there. The single thing that has happened in my life that has led literally to all of my success. Above and beyond everything. So I don't, you know, it's not something I did alone. It's something that I have had tests and challenges. I mean, I remember times... My wife, Homera, would say, you know, there were times growing my business, especially in the winter when things slowed down. And uh, I would have anxiety and even depression. I couldn't come out of my room at times, right? And she dealt with all of that, right? Um, but those challenges as well led me to learning. I still go through that. I <laughs> Like, it's, you know... I think I'm a very slow learner. I'm a very quick study, but I'm a very slow learner. You know, it's a, one of the things Abdul Baha, the son of Baha'u'llah, the center of his covenant, referred to as the master. Abdul Baha means servant of the glory. One of the things that he wrote, as ye have faith, so shall your blessings and powers be. This is the balance. This is the balance. This is the balance. Wow. So you would think after all of these years of like flying into the wind in fear right? and doing a thing, right? And then having such wonderful confirmations, but also these challenges along the way, like while you're between confirmations come these challenges and then losing heart again, right? Uh, this is the one area I consider myself, well, there are more areas, so this is the main area I consider myself to be not a quick study, <laughs> not even a slow study, a terrible study, right? I have had enough confirmations to know when the tests come, I should just be grateful for the test, and uh, I'm not always that. And, it, and I want to say this as well, you know, like this, I said earlier that Obedience to the institution was not a pure thing for me, if I'm honest. And this is also to the mercy of God. I was leaving a business I didn't like. I was in the middle of a separation that was ultimately a divorce, okay, my first, uh, my first marriage. I was running away in part was a great excuse for me. Hey, the institution is called and I'm going to be obedient and go, right? I mean, I was being obedient. I don't mean to, but I never considered it a pure act. It was colored with all of this other motivation, right? I know it's okay for men to cry. My family taught me that. It was therefore in my mind, in our limited conception, right, undeserved, and in part it was undeserved, to be led to every incredible thing that's ever happened in my life. This amazing woman that I met and married, right, um, it didn't matter. I still got the bounties of the obedience. Wow, that's like a mind blower to me. 
Think about it. Think about it. It's huge. <laughs> it's great. I'm wondering, as you're doing this work, and you mentioned the story of how you got the short end of the stick from uh, this manager that took advantage of you. Were there certain qualities, or certain virtues, or attributes imbued in your work that you feel contributed to your success? Uh, to start, integrity comes to mind. No, it's without it's without without question. Uh, I think it's a moral imperative for how we all must live. I don't have any question in my mind. Have there been times that have uh, that have tested me in that regard? Absolutely. Have I ever been without integrity? I'm sure, absolutely. But as a as a principal, well, I I told my sales agents, at, you know, during, you know, I've been retired since I was 50 and I am doing other things, but, uh, I think there are basically three most fundamental principles for success. If I was going to, you know, pick the top three and one of them absolutely is integrity. I mean, it's just, uh, it's not rocket science. I mean, it's, it's, in, it's intuitive, right? It's not counterintuitive. It's intuitive. It's common sense. You can't be in a business for long and treat people unfairly, be deceptive, all of that, and ultimately be successful. You can't. And there are, there's so much like that that when you have a reputation for integrity, that's huge. It's, that's money in the bank. Not that you should do it for that reason, but that is just like, for me, that's an axiomatic truth. Like you can't deny it. It People want to do business with people they can trust. I mean, uh, the executive director of the nonprofit that I founded, which I know you're going to want to talk about later, she didn't. She she doesn't take credit for the saying, but I'd never heard it before. Relationships grow at the speed of trust, and there's not a lot of trust often in business. People are out for themselves, so I think that's a big thing. I think the second thing is equally important: is service. So one of the principles of the high faith is that in you know actually service is the highest station. I think about the biblical quote, the, first, the last shall be first and the first shall be last, right? Those who are serving, especially those who serve while under oppression, while accepting that oppression with grace, who knows what their condition in the next world will be? Who knows? I don't know, that's for sure, right? Um, I come from a privileged class and I've, you know, had every benefit. Um, but service is the highest station that man can attain in this life. And um, so one of the, one of the writings is that um, whatever your occupation, your profession, doesn't matter what it is the lowest or the highest, whatever we consider that to be, okay? Um, service in the spirit of benefit to those you're serving, to your fellow man, is elevated to the station of prayer. Wow, <laughs> that's pretty, pretty extraordinary. And, you know, in many professions, you know, you begin with your time. You can sell your time. That's it. And that and and that's fine, and you can be successful doing that. But to take a business to a level of success, you need to buy back your time. You need to leverage your time, and you leverage your time through giving other people opportunities to serve the same process, right? And hopefully, you have integrity and let them do well to help them to do well. Because when they do well, you'll do well. 
But in order to get those folks to follow, you must have a vision. You must be clear, crystal clear. And you must be able to articulate with clarity what that vision is and how to get there. And then you must help them get there. And you must keep giving them things that help communicate the vision. Or you can't, you can't succeed if you don't know what your business is about and you can't explain it to other people to make it really simple. So service, integrity, and extraordinary ability to communicate. And you may not have that quality. Find somebody who does. <laughs> There are so many things in my own business. I, for a long time, I have to say this. I think it makes you, I, I just, I'm just honest. You know, honesty goes with integrity. Uh, for the longest time, I felt in my business like a fraud. You know that, what's that syndrome, fraud syndrome, right? I still have difficult, I don't like details. I'm a very global thinker and I don't have a lot of patience. It's not one of my, that's a quality of God, by the way. And I've learned to have more of it, but that is, you know, all of us are born in this world with some sort of propensity for some of the qualities of God and they're infinite. Love, honesty, mercy, justice, wisdom, patience, long suffering. It, you can't name them all. They're endless, right? And some of us have some and some of us have little of some, right? We're all made up in different ways, which makes it very interesting. My One of my least qualities is patience. So I work with it, and I have become more patient. That's all we can do, right? We can't do any more than that. I was uh, thinking in terms of feeling like a fraud. I have trouble even now with detail. It would have served me well at some point to really sit down and study the detail of a financial statement, of a profit and loss sheet, right? I still struggle looking at those. And I thought to myself, how can I, like, how can I call myself a business person? I don't, these are like the most basic things. I felt guilty that I never went on to get a, a master's in business. But the reality is I had people around me that could read financial sheets, did go through the time, effort, energy, financial cost, and whatever of becoming a, uh, of getting a master's in business. What I had were these other three things, right? In abundance, I had them. And I didn't value them. I was, you know, because again, as I said earlier, we live in a society where we're, we beat each other up and then we beat ourselves up, right? And it took me a long time to realize because I was able to help people that had degrees in business to become more successful because I had some gifts to offer and they were offering me the gift of their knowledge and that by doing that when they worked for me. I didn't need to have that. <laughs> it was okay. And so, and that's a message I would give to everybody. Like, Strengthen your weaknesses. We should be doing that. I should have done a better job of that. What have you, okay? But find your strengths and be generous with your strengths. Help other people if you can. Be giving of the, of the things you have strengths on. There's, there's this fascinating research I heard about from Harvard where these economists uh, looked at the idea that the most valuable resource isn't oil or minerals or technology it's actually trust so they compared the the countries of japan and venezuela where uh, japan has this booming economy and very little natural resources they have a lot of fish and not much else whereas venezuela has oil in abundance but if we compare the two which is doing better Venezuela is in bankruptcy, practically, if it's not. Yeah. Yeah. So it's this idea. It's a fascinating idea that a virtue could actually be something that is itself a resource. That's beautifully said. And it's true. It's true. Yeah. I'd say even beyond that is consciousness. Being aware 
of the value of not not only trust but all of the virtues, as you're saying. That that's the bottom line. I mean, we are human, and we're imperfect. But struggling toward that, I think, is is something that really attracts attracts to ourselves. Speaking of consciousness, and when you do something because you know you have to. Can you tell me about education under fire? I don't know. I've always felt the need to correct an injustice, almost to the point my, my family is like, you're not doing anymore, Dad, because I often, do, I often put myself in a position where I bite off a lot, more than I should probably be chewing, right? And then the fear and the anxiety and dealing with all of that. But... Uh, and education under fire was not a was was not immune to that. It was a very stressful uh, thing, but I have been very moved by the plight of the Baha'is of Iran from the early days of the faith when twenty thousand were killed, and in more modern times, horrible things, just terrible. And um, one of the things that the Islamic Republic of Iran, the current government, did was after you know coming into power, they shut down the Baha'i administration in Iran. They would allow, and of course, the Baha'is are obedient to their government. So they had no, they still have to this day, it's been 40 years, no national assembly, no local assemblies. They had a group called the Iran, which in Farsi means friends. And uh, the members of the Iran, this was back in around 2010, were arrested, and convicted and given long present, uh, prison terms. I think at the time it was 10 years and then they, el they escalated that. So I set out to do a, an initiative in defense of the, the Iran. We did a program at the University of Miami and all of that. And I decided then that I wanted to make a, a film about the story of the Iran. These people who had been arrested for the crime of being a Baha'i, and it wasn't a formal institution. They were just like helping the Baha'is in the country, helping them with marriages, helping them with funerals, because there are some rites of passage and things like that that have to, have to be fulfilled. And they were arrested. They were not allowed uh, defense attorneys. It was a sham. It was a sh they, they were sham trials. They were convicted. They were given prison, ter prison terms. And I wanted to make a film about it. And this was when I was consulting with the National Assembly. I had already been introduced to a wonderful filmmaker, Jeff Kaufman, in L.A. And I wanted to do the first thing that I did with Jeff. I, I, I met him by flying out there. Uh, the local spiritual assembly invited Iranians to meet with me. And uh, I wanted to find stories of, of Iranian Baha'is who had relatives who had been executed by the, by the current regime. And I called the project Angels of Iran. I flew to LA, I met Jeff Kaufman for the first time. We met with, we had this wonderful evening. We, we asked them to just tell their stories. And at the end of it, I said, well, we've planned to stay here. We've got a crew put together for the weekend, Saturday and Sunday, half the day on Sunday, then we have to leave. We would like to know who here would tell their story. We want to, we want to interview you and film, and we, we're doing a series. And so that was what I had done with Jeff, created this series, Angels of Iran. And, uh, and then when the, the Iran situation broke, I asked him if he would, you know, if he would, he would write, direct, and produce a documentary that I would executive produce. I'd find the money for it. And, uh, and he agreed. And then I went to the, to, because I, as a Baha'i, I can't do that without approval by the National Assembly. And I was told no a couple times. <laughs> I kept going back, <laughs> just like I did at the Meridian, right? I kept going back and said, well, what about this? And what about that? And eventually they said, okay, you can do it. And then in the course of it, we were in pre-production, still developing the script and, and so forth. And uh, then I got a call from the secretary of the National Assembly, and he asked me to, you know, uh, to meet with him, to talk to him 
by uh, phone at the time. And we talked and he said, you know, would you be willing to switch gears? I was told that that the National was asked because they knew of the project, that they had approved it. And the National had been asked by the House of Justice if instead of doing a story about the Iran, I would do a story about this new story that was just coming out. The BHA, the Baha'i Institute for Higher Education, which was the only medium by which any Baha'i was able to get a higher education. They'd been barred by the government since 1979. No young Baha'i could go to college because they were a Baha'i. And on their forums, you had to say what your religion was. It was mandatory. And a Baha'i will never dissimulate their faith. The Baha'i will always, if he's asked and has to say what he is, he's not going to make it up. He's going to say he's a Baha'i. And that would exclude you from the right for to, to go to college. So the Baha'is had, you know, uh, former professors, because they weren't allowed to teach either if they were a Baha'i. Professors, uh, dentists, engineers formed a nucleus of an ad hoc university system where the students would get their coursework in a, in a manner that was, there was no classrooms, it would be brought to them, they would have to do their homework, they would take their tests, they would be sent the tests, Some, a courier would pick up the tests, all of that, and that's how they educated the fortunate, because they couldn't do all, everyone, the fortunate students, and it had just happened. It, there had been skirmishes before, but it had just happened where the government sent in their, I shouldn't use the term, stormtroopers, okay? For me, it's the equivalent of that, to harass these uh, administrative people, the professors, the admin people, to uh, confiscate their computers, to shut them down in effect, and then to ch ultimately charge them with criminal behavior for educating <laughs> their community that was not allowed to be educated, if you will. And as soon as I heard the story, well, it didn't matter. If the, I, I didn't get a directive from the House directly. I could have asked for it, I'm sure. But if the National Assembly is asking me to do it, there was no question. So we switched gears and decided to make that film. I didn't want to just make a film, though. I wasn't interested in making a film. I wanted to do a, I wanted to create a movement. I wanted to create a campaign. And so the idea was to make the film while we created relationships with youth and young adults who were, for the most part, college students so that they would open the door through Baha'i clubs and other clubs to, to screen the film and have a conversation and have a small panel of folks that could answer questions that could, and that we would write answers and, and you know, give guidance and so forth. And uh, again, <laughs> ultimately I was, I was permitted to work with the National Spiritual Assembly. And then amazing things began to happen. So I know that it was the right thing. There were several things that happened. First of all, the guy who I hired, who was not a Baha'i, to make the film, had a history with Amnesty International, consulted with them, and Amnesty International became our partner. That was huge. And then there was another situation that happened that was just mind-boggling, really in terms of its, we talk about the concourse on high, that is the, these spiritual souls in concert that have gone beyond this plane, that through their prayers and through perhaps actions of some kind that we don't understand, they can intervene. And they have in my life. I don't know who they are, and I don't purport to any of that. All I know is, here's what I know. I know that if your intention is right, and if you especially are doing things that enhance the principle, 
This is the call of the age, by the way, the oneness of mankind. And if you work hard, and if you have integrity, and if your spirit is one of service, and if you can communicate all of those three things, right, that I said, right, you will attract blessings and confirmations beyond your wildest dreams. There's no question about that in my mind. No question. It's often undeserved and completely 100% irrefutable. You cannot refute it. Yeah, I can't prove it to you sitting here, but you try it and you will see. There's no, no question. But you have to have, you have to be in the right spirit. You have to be doing it, I think, for the right reason. Even if not, I mean, you could be blessed even if it's not fully pure. I explained that earlier. But uh, so here's the other thing that happened. I think it was Jeff introduced me, the filmmaker, to this woman. But she convinced me that she could deliver Nobel Peace Laureates to support the work I wanted to do. She had a website that served only, not all Nobel laureates, only Nobel Peace laureates. Go figure. Just what I needed, right? And so I, I had written a, the communicator, right? I had written a statement about education under fire that could be a letter or a vision document, whatever you want to call it, to anybody that would get involved or to anybody who the person who got involved could take to a, a university dean or professor, or whatever, okay? And then the National Assembly edited it. So we had this document, right? And so she knew of the document, and she said, what I'd like to do is to see if I can get Desmond Tutu, probably the most, one of the two or three most famous Nobel laureates in the world. <laughs> and there was another one, I didn't even know who he was, okay? But he happened to be a president, a, a sitting, active, current head of state, Jose Ramos Horta, the president of East Timor at the time, became the second and the two of them agreed to be the author of the letter. <laughs> so now I had two, I mean, one the most famous and the other a president. <laughs> Both Nobel laureates that wrote this thing. So, so we had this letter. And then the other thing is I, I suggested to the, to the national let me write a few letters. Every month, there's a Baha'i, every 19 days, Baha'i month, new Baha'i month, 19 months of 19 days. And every t everywhere in the world, there are local, what we call feasts, administered by the local assemblies of the, there's thousands, probably tens of thousands by now. In America, it has been for years part of the process where the National Assembly sends a letter to every community for feast. I said, let a couple of these letters over time be about education under fire. Or send letters directly to all the youth in the, in the clubs and encourage them to consider this. Look at this. Defend the Iranian Baha'is. Encourage that. And they did it. We had hundreds and hundreds of screening conversations. And we had all of these wonderful, I mean, one ask alone. No university in any uh, foreign international country that is not sanctioned by the government of that country will ever gain the ability to have their credits accepted in America. And for sure, <laughs> this, this government that's shutting down 
the Baha'i institution that's just doing its own thing quietly and imprisoning the people that are trying to do it definitely are not sanctioning (laughs) those credits, right? So we took the story, Education Under Fire, the film, and we had panels and conversations. And one of the things, you know, we, we said, okay, you're probably wondering why we're here and what we're asking, right? So one of the things we're asking is accept these credits. If ever, if ever a student on this planet evidence their sincerity for education to be educated, it would be people who for 40 years are denied the right to it, who have to receive their learning, their tests in through written letters, maybe traveling great distances to even get it, to meet those who are currying. They can't go everywhere, and they had to travel. And working hard to do that, if ever anybody deserved an education, if anybody was a stellar student, passed in those circumstances, and had the passion to go on, you're looking at them. That was our story. There were many, many, many results. One of them was that Harvard School of Education accepted the credits. So the result of this was that a number of schools accepted the credit for the Baha'i Institute for Higher Education? Well, that's one of the results. I think the biggest thing for us was just bringing awareness. I think it also, I mean, according to the Secretary of the National Assembly, what we did sort of set the stage for a lot of other things that followed. And so it doesn't matter. I mean, we did. We worked hard. We had a great team. We worked hard. There were some other great results. He's going to kill me for telling this story, but I'm going to tell it anyway. So we were struggling to put an adequate team together. We never had an adequate team, right? My son had just graduated. Anise had just graduated from Boston University, and he was he in he had been accepted as an intern for a very well-regarded, large advertising agency in New York called Big Spaceship, I think is what it was called. And he was going to go do that. And I said, no, you're not going to do that. He said, what? I said, no, I don't want you to do that. I have something I need you to do. He said, but dad, that's what I want to do. I said, well, listen, we covered the cost of your education for the last four years. You owe me the summer. He said, well, what do you want me to do? I said, well, We've got this amazing thing in defense of, first of all, he loves Iran. Your mom's Iranian, (laughs) okay? And we're going to be defending the Bihei with a film, and we have these letters from the Nobel laureates. We have all these tools, right? And we need national campaign coordinators, and you're going to be one of those. I said, Dad, they accepted me. I want to go do this. I'm on my, I said, no. They said, okay. I said, listen, do it for 60 days, and then you can go do whatever you want. He had no choice. <laughs> Kicking and screaming, he came. So so what happened was that um, we got the first screening conversation to be at Columbia University. We had this wonderful professor who was in support of it, Iranian, Iranian history, Iranian studies, whatever, big deal. And so we were going there. I didn't want to go to New York for just one thing. So I set out to, remember I told you the story about knocking on multiple doors? (laughs) You knock on one, maybe. You knock on more than one, your chances improve, right? Uh, So I started making some calls, connected with NYU, their Baha'i Club, and I don't remember exactly how Mm -hmm. it happened. But we got a, that weekend, we got the second event to be at NYU. So... Anise had been studying at Boston, Boston University. He was in New York, right? That's where the big spaceship gig was going to be and all of that. And so I said, okay, Anise, you got your first gig. You go into New York. You're going to work with the Baha'i clubs, and you're going to be on the panel. 
I'm not sure about the panel, but you're going to, you're going to be the coordinator. You're going to go by now. He knew that it was not negotiable. So he went to New York. He was the education under fire national team member on the ground. And he, in the course of that, he meets the, I think she was the chairperson of the Baha'i club at NYU. You know the story? I, yeah, I know where this is going. You know where it's going? He's married to her now. <laughs> they fell in love and they got married. So now I tell him, Anise, if I feel strongly, and I don't tell him what to do. He's an adult. I, you know, I'm, I love him so much. He's such a great, great guy. You know, <laughs> on a rare occasion, I've said to him, you remember? And I feel strongly about this. You remember the outcome? So don't just like say no. You need to think about it. Moving on, after the Education Under Fire initiative, you uh, founded the Raising Haiti Foundation. Can you tell me what that is? And Sure. No, actually, I did not found it. Before it was the Raising Haiti Foundation, it was the Association of the Peasants of Fondwa USA Foundation. And one thing I know right off the bat is like, you don't pick a name that's that long that nobody knows what any of the words mean. Okay. <laughs> that doesn't fall under the, you know, under the banner of clarity of communication to be able to lead folks to where you want them to go. So I got a phone call from my now very dear friend who, without whom education under fire would not have happened. The writer, director, producer, Jeff Kaufman, he calls me <laughs> And he says, David, I got a favor to ask you. I said, what? <laughs> I said, oh, God, whatever it is, I got to do it because he's done so many favors for me. I owe him like for eternity, right? He said, I have met a guy I want to be the subject of my next film in Haiti. He's an amazing guy. And he uh, has created all these cool things. But I want to vet him a little bit. And I trust your business judgment. I want you to meet him. So I want to fly to Haiti with you, Port-au-Prince. So we flew to Haiti, and I had a chance to meet Father Joseph Philippe. At the time, I, I was very impressed with what I saw. He has. He's founded uh, the largest microcredit entity in Haiti. It still is, Fondwa. He founded a, a rural university, University of Fondwa. And it was doing interesting things. He also founded the Association of the Peasants of Fondwa. What was that? Well, that was the entity to take his rural work. He had really very interesting concepts, and they were and they're good concepts, to take them forward. So he had created this. It was a Haitian foundation. He created an American foundation to raise money for it. There was a lawyer here who had offer, offered to do it pro bono. Uh, and there were other people that joined whatever. And so they opened the 501c3, the Association of Peasants of Fondwa USA Foundation. And in the meantime, Jeff made the film. I was living in South Florida, Boca Raton, Florida. The film was finished. It happened to have its premiere in Palm Beach, which is like a 30 minute drive for me. And they invited me to come, of course. I was, uh, Homera and I were uh, executive producers of the film because we had, as other people had, we had put up some money, uh, contributed some money to help him make the film. It wasn't a great deal, but we got a you know producer credit or whatever. So they invited me, of course, to go, and I attended. And when it was over, many of the folks that were connected to Father Joseph were there. Father Joseph was there, and they wanted to consult with me. They wanted to talk to me. And so we had a consultation. I don't remember exactly what we said. But a few months later, they called me, and they said, listen, you know, we're struggling with the foundation. We would like you to be on the board, and we would like you to be our executive director for free. 
not that I wouldn't have done it for free. It wasn't the point was they couldn't afford to hire anybody, right? And I said, I've never done this before. I'm retired. I, I'm not going to do that. I can't do that. I'm happy to make a small contribution again, but I'm not doing that. They kept coming. But they did the thing that I do, right? They kept coming back and asking me to do it. And I said, no. And then one night, I had a dream. This was in 20... 15, 16, where they were already creating new URL suffixes because there were no more good .com or .org names left, right? And in my dream came to me the phrase, the Raising Haiti Foundation. I've always been really good at like this kind of stuff. I've never been a profession. But I said, okay. So I woke up. I had to write it down quickly because if I wake up remembering something and go back to sleep or even just don't think about it for an hour, I forgot what it is. Did that ever happen to you? Yeah. Just you got to write it down. Otherwise, it's gone. Got to write it down, right? So I wrote it down. I think I went back to sleep, woke up again, had it written down. I went to my computer and I went to uh, GoDaddy and I put in... I swear to you, RaisingHaiti.com and RaisingHaiti.org were available. The first thing I did is I said, oh, my God, I took them. <laughs> took those two domains immediately, instantly. What was so interesting is like when I Googled it, there was a Raising Haiti group or foundation, I don't remember, a group of nurses in the Northeast somewhere had formed a, an entity called that, but they didn't take the domain. They didn't have a website. Okay, so I took the domain, and then I was praying and thinking about it. I said, okay, all right, God, little tap on the shoulder here. I didn't, I mean, I wasn't thinking anything. Once that happened, I said, I think I'm meant to do this thing. <laughs> I said, but I'll, I'll make a deal with you, God. You know that I hate minutia. You know that I hate details. I've never been an executive director. I wasn't a particularly good day-to-day -day manager. I was very good at being able to identify people and lead them to wealth and success. But I wasn't somebody you would want to work under at that time. <laughs> there were a lot of areas in which I still don't consider myself a good manager. I said, so... I'm going to have to raise some serious money to be able to have a staff. I can't do this on my own. I won't do that. And I said, I said I'm going to need $200,000. So I got my lovely wife to agree. I could put up 50 of that. And then I put my little you know presentation together about what he was doing in the film and all of that. And in two weeks, I raised another $150,000. And I was so, like, uh, deluded to think to myself, oh, raising money to do this is going to be easy. And I was, like, omitting to that calculus two factors. One factor was if you intend to do the right thing and you work hard with integrity and service or all that stuff, right? The universe will help you. I wasn't so sure I wanted the universe's help in this case, right? I didn't really want to do this thing at that time. And um, the other thing is I was tapping my warm market. I was calling like our investor group that, you know, they make a fee for everything. They, you know, they handle our investments in, in my, in our retirement and some other businesses I was working with, and some other people I knew. They're the easiest, like, that's the low-hanging fruit, right? They all said yes, and I raised another $150,000, and I made a deal. I said, okay, you know, and I, but I also said, like, I will, be ex I will be on the board, but I'll be an executive director for one year. I told them that. I said, after that, if this doesn't work, I'm out. I'm not, I can't do that. I'm curious, what work was the foundation doing? Predominantly, the foundation was raising money to support the, US, the foundation of the peasants of Fondois in Haiti. 
USA Foundation of the uh, Foundation of the Peasants of Fondwa USA Foundation. Right, that's what we were doing. Also to help, like the university, we the uh, microcredit Fondwa didn't need our help. They were making millions. They were doing a lot of business. They were already well established. Um, so my our role was to raise money for Father Joseph at that time. The first thing I had to do was rebrand, get rid of the website, do a new website, rebrand it, rebrand the communications of it, and to do all of that. The people of Haiti, I call it the country of Job. You know, Haiti was the most, was one of the most successful, flourishing countries in the Western Hemisphere. Today, it is the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. I think the fifth poorest in the world. And it's because, I don't know if you know the story, you can find the stories in the New York Times. They did a whole trilogy of those stories. But, you know, Haiti was the first country to throw off the yoke of uh, slavery. It beat the French, <laughs> sent them with their tail between their legs home. But they returned with a battleship. And whereas the enslaved Africans of Haiti should have been given reparations, they turned the thing 180 degrees and they demanded reparations for having uh, lost their slaves. And they said, you will pay these reparations. You see this, this boat? We will destroy this place. You'll have no home. You'll drown in the ocean, whatever. And the Haitians had no choice but to pay those reparations, but they couldn't pay the reparations. They were too much. And the French said, oh, okay, we're, we're loving people. We're just, this government. We'll give you a loan. And they gave them a usurious loan, which has never been repaid. And then the United States got involved. They continued that process. And today, like 80% of the gross national product of Haiti goes toward the loan. This is my understanding from the articles I read. And so today, Haitians aspire to poverty. They live in sub-poverty. It's horrible. And all of these things that are happening with the gangs now and all of these things are deplorable, understandable. Also, the natural disasters. You know, well, I'll tell you what we're doing now. The long and short of it is, let me just say this, all of this has been just like meant to be. You know, as it so happens... Remember I said that I would only do this for a year. Well, a year went and gone, and I, I, I could not, like, just walk away. But about 18 months in, I met this most amazing woman. She's one of my favorite people on the planet. And she had 25 years. She was a uh, soon-to-be-retiring ophthalmology surgeon. But for 25 years, 25 years earlier... She had gotten her church, Our Lady Queen of Peace, in Arlington, Virginia, to engage with the parish twinning programs of the Americas. This is an amazing Catholic-based organization who have paired 300 American church, Catholic churches with 300 parishes in Haiti. The churches here, like sister churches, right, finding ways to support each of their sisters in Haiti. Now, Sue won't let me probably say this, but I'm saying it anyway. Certainly one of the two or three most successful uh, in terms of volume of support uh, churches in that program, the church that she led to it and that she leads fundraising and everything else in, our Lady Queen of Peace. They had raised over 25 years 
a few million dollars. They have built multiple, like four different schools. In Haiti, you can't go to school. unless There's no public school unless you can pay a fee. Who can pay a fee? They're, they're, they barely can feed their families, right? So you have to be an affluent Haitian, which is still someone living probably in poverty, to, to scrape together enough money to pay the fees. So she built schools that are today t educating 6,000 students. Clinics she built. Now, when I say each, each uh, church would have a parish, right? The parish is called Maydor. But it's not just, there's a community called Maydor, but the parish is 70 square miles. There are multiple communities and they have in strategic places, they have built different clinics. They have pure water systems, all of these things that they've done. And I met her and the minute I met, and not only that, this, when they decided to work with Parish Twinning, they said, we want the most difficult least accessible part of Haiti that no one else will take. <laughs> Who says that? Right? She said that. So this was her. Sue Carlson. Not only that, so to get to this place, you fly to Port-au-Prince. She's coming from, you know, from New Jersey. Got to fly into Miami, fly into Port-au-Prince, get a, car, a vehicle, drive three hours to get to a place where you can't drive anymore. Then someone has to meet you with a donkey, two donkeys, one for them <laughs> to guide you and one for you, right? And you travel over mountainous terrain for four hours, three, four hours to get to the, the Mayor, Maydor uh, main hub. And then if you have to go to the different places, you got to travel, it's 70 miles, 70 square miles. It's huge. And she did it twice a year for 25 years. As soon as I met her, I said, I knew you are, you have to be our executive director. <laughs> you have to be. And when I first asked her, she said, you're crazy. Like, I, I'm doing all I can to, I'm still working. She was retiring soon. I'm working, I'm, re and I'm, I have all these commitments. I said, what if we do it together? You help me. She thought about it and prayed about it. And she said, okay, I like you. Okay, I'll do it with you. <laughs> months and months in, things began to happen. And eventually I said, I have to step down. You're stepping down? I said, yeah, but I'll remain on the board. She said, well, yeah, you have to be the president of the board. You can't, you have to work with me. I said, Okay, I'll absolutely, and I've done it. This has been an amazing relationship uh, for the past six or seven years. But one of the things that happened, this is another, like she, their church had been working with an organization called Smallholder Farmers Alliance, a Haitian organization, but with a partner in the States. And what they did was quite extraordinary. They opened up relationships in villages that wanted to do this. One of the things that happened in Haiti, even with the Clinton Foundation, they threw a lot of money at Haiti. One of the things that also happened to Haiti, if you take an aerial shot, Haiti is an island that's divided between Haiti and the Dominican Republic, the DR. And if you, if you look at an aerial shot, the Dominican Republic where the border is, is forested. It's got beautiful, it's green. The other side is like brown. There's no trees, literally. And the reason is because people are living in poverty. They can't, it's cold there when it gets cold. And they have to have power. And you can't, they can't afford oil. They can't afford any power except for chopping down trees and making charcoal out of it. That's what they fuel with, charcoal, for the most part. And so it's been completely deforested. So what smallholder farmers is brilliant. What they do is they come into a community with agricultural training, 
under the auspices of a of a of a degreed agronomist with farm tools that have to be purchased with seed cr crop that has to be purchased and with livestock that has to be purchased no one gets any money but they're told you come together and we'll teach you how to plant trees seedlings and then we'll teach you how to transport those seedlings in small that are in facilities where you are into a designated forest area and then you take care of those trees make sure they grow and nobody chops them down <laughs> and as long as you're doing that in the program we will give you credits tree currency <laughs> it's brilliant It's amazing to me, you know, the expression necessity is the mother of invention. What we can do with nothing, literally with nothing. And they get tree credits that can be redeemed for agricultural training, farm tools, seeds, and livestock. Okay, because they don't have any money. Okay, and that is the transaction. So this incredible organization is supporting the environment. The more I talk about it, the more I feel like I can raise more money for them. But think about it. The environment, the other thing that smallholders does is a small version of Fondwa only for the farm families that are enrolled in the program. For the women, they... They give small loans. They, they start with a very small amount of money. And they, there's a whole system to doing it where a group of maybe 12 women are in a team. So if one of them fails, the other, one has to, other ones have to fix it. This has been going on for years, and there's never been a default. There's not a bank in the Western world you can say that about. It's mind-boggling. Small scale but it's changing lives. So it's women's, women's issues, women's rights. It's the environment. It is poverty because the, in the program, these farmers are several thousand of them now. Their incomes have grown 50 to 100%. In, you know, so it's, again, they're moving from sub-poverty to poverty, okay? They're able to send their kids to school. Like, that's the difference, right? Um, all of the core challenges in the world, also food insecurity, food insecurity, the environment, women's issues, and poverty. Those are the f four most significant global problems there are. This small organization deals with all of them in a way that does not it's not wasteful where you throwing money at a problem. That's not, that's not, you know, these people do the work. They have a thing, they have a thing they've had for hundreds of years called the combit. And what it is, is Haitians working together to do something. So they do like a formal combit as part of the thing when they're taking the, 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 the seedlings, the trees, right? Little baby trees to the forest, right? They have a whole system for doing that. The community does it together. It's a beautiful thing. So that becomes the focus of Raising Haiti. We, everything we've done, we've done for the most part for this organization. And it's a joy. Like there are Haitians that are running it. The, the Haitian agronomist on the ground that is the CEO of it in Haiti is on our board. We have a wonderful relationship. Uh, it's growing. And so I actually wrote an article. I don't know if you want to like put a link in when you're doing this. It's an article that I wrote during COVID. It's called Haiti COVID-19 and the Universal Law of Abundance. And the story is about Sue Carlson. It's about this amazing woman who rightfully, logically said, I can't do that thing. 
but who did it, and now her scope of impact is geometrically more than it was. It hasn't taken anything away. It's grown what she's doing in Maydor, and it's also now in many other locations. And there was an opportunity uh, for a particular community that was like a perfect fit, needed funding. So Homera and I agreed to be one-third funder for three years. And smallholder farmers was getting most of their funding from Timberland. Timberland agreed. And then Raising Haiti had to raise the other third. And that worked for a couple of years. And then Timberland withdrew from Haiti for whatever reason. So smallholder farmers has been really in trouble. We lost that. And then because of smallholder farmers being in trouble, Raising Haiti needed to do more. So we weren't really able. So all that we could do was Homera and I at that time. And so we had to cut the program in half. We had to... We had to do a lot less, but we wanted to keep it going, and so we did. Well, just this year, our only institutional funder, driven by another Baha'i, the first American billionaire to become a Baha'i. <laughs> I'm not going to name him because he'll probably be embarrassed. You can look that up and probably figure it out. But they had, they became very quickly our really our only consistent institutional funder and they've been from the time that I start I was referred to them you they won't they you have to be referred to them and I knew both Steve I said it Steve Sarowitz bless his heart and uh Sohail Sohail who is the uh COO of the National Baha'i Center Sohail approached me one day and he said you know there's a guy you need to meet and the two of you are like cut from the same cloth. And so he introduced me to Steve. I ended up flying to the national um, offices for a meeting they had, a consultation they had with you know business owners and whatever at the house of worship. Steve was there, we really connected and agreed to meet the next day. It was one of the things he did that he, also from a Jewish background, relatively young Baha'i, so dedicated to teaching the Baha'i faith. He wanted to be a tour guide. <laughs> this guy's a billionaire, right? It's, it's, it, I don't, I mean, I say that with absolute respect. This is what a billionaire should do. He wanted to be a tour guide at the house of worship so he could meet people and share the vision of Baha'u'llah with them and, and, and show them around and do all of that. <laughs> I have to tell you about this guy. And I'm like going out, probably have to, get him to agree to this, but I think he probably would anyway. So the day he picks me up, right, the next day, he picks me up at my hotel, and I had a cup of coffee in my hand, like a, a to-go cup with a lid on it. He picks me up in this old, beat-up Toyota. I think it was like a, you know, Toyota Corolla or something, but old. And as he, as he reaches over and opens the door, he's a big, tall guy, six foot seven, something like that. He's got long arms, reaches over, opens it up. And there's like newspapers and mag rubbish on the passenger side floor. Right? He just tossed it there. And he starts cleaning it up and he apologizes. And, and I'm helping him. I put the coffee up on the top of the thing. He tells me, don't forget your coffee. And I get my coffee. I'm getting in and he apologizes to me, Right? because there's no cup holder in the car. <laughs> so, so years later, he calls me and he says, David, the Toyota is shot. I mean, it won't drive anymore. And I need another car. This is the only car the guy I have, right? So he wants my opinion. <laughs> Should I get a Prius or a Tesla? I said, Steve, you're a billionaire. Get the Tesla. What's the matter with you, right? <laughs> I called him. I said, well, what did you get? He said, oh, I got the uh, Prius. I said, why'd you call me? You know, I'm kidding. But um, so Steve's organization, Julia, Julian Grace Foundation, has been funding us. So they have a new executive director, lovely African-American gentleman. And he, from a foundation like this, you never get what you ask for. And they guide you to what you should ask for. So you don't want to, like, seem greedy, right? 
We always need more. But this guy was first time in. He loved what we were doing. And he said, tell me what you need. And so beyond the things that they had done the year before, Sue said, you know, we have a problem with one of our communities. We lost two of our three funders. They were going to do it for three years. We haven't gotten anybody else. The other funder has not only held on, but they've increased their funds, but we've had to cut it to half. He said, well, just tell me what you want. Well, we need an extra whatever for that. It was quite a bit. And we got it. So if I had not been guided to do this thing, had Sue not come along when she did, had I not been given, like the deal I made with God, right? Had I not been given the Raising Haiti Foundation perfect.com to rebrand, this, could you think of a better name for a Haitian foundation fundraising in America than the Raising Haiti Foundation? I mean, there's not a better one. There might be some that people got early that are just as good. You know, like Haiti.com would probably be better. Okay, but this is, you know, this is amazing to get in 2016. It's just unbelievable. All of those things hadn't happened. Had had Sue not come along, had she not said, this is crazy. But then I found a way to get her on board. And then, you know, we still work together. She does everything. It's the easiest job I ever had because of who she is. She calls me when she needs me. I am working to help. Uh, raise funds. I'm working to help with branding issues, with communications issues, with ideas in that regard. But she comes to me and she is unbelievable. In fact, this new organization, um, I asked her to be on the board. She was for a while. She said she really had to step down. I said, well, you can step down, but you have to be our treasurer. Will you be our treasurer? She, she is. And we were then a fiscal sponsored organization where there wasn't much to do because the back office is all handled by a, a 501c3. That's what they do. They take smaller groups that don't want to do that, charge them a fee. In that case, it was 6%. And they do all that work. Well, we've recently become a 501c3. So I had to go back to Sue and said, and, and I, found a, uh, I found an accounting firm that's very inexpensive, it's a one-time annual fee. They have some, you know, other things you have to pay for if you want them. But the basics of it is affordable. You know that there's no hidden costs. And so they do that. And I said, well, there's more for you to do. Will you please do that for me? Because I, we can't right now, the, the new organization, which I know you're going to get to in a minute, is really struggling. We, you know, we are the only funders at this point. And so we're on... We're operating on fumes at this point. Again, it's Homera and I that are doing it. But some amazing things have happened there that we're like on the verge of another. I know that it's going to work. I don't know how it's going to work. <laughs> and I, when I say I know it's going to work, I really don't 100% believe that. I'd say like at 90%, this should work based on my experience in the past, not because of me, but because of the process that's unfolded. Um and I hope that that's the case. Yeah. What you're referring to, I take it, is uh, the nonprofit partners in racial justice. Yeah, that's another example of something of a, of a domain I should never have found. I mean, what could be better than an organization that is predominantly made up of dark-skinned people, but in collaboration? right, that sets out to find creative ways and means of bringing all people together in the pursuit of oneness, healing, unity, equal justice, what name could be, be that truly believes that the people coming along to work with us are our partners. We're learning every day from people we never met before. What could be a better title than that? Partners in Racial Justice, right? Says it all. I love it. What does this organization do and where did it come from? Well, we started in COVID. 
So everything we did was about developing virtual programs. We use Zoom. And we have on board just some of the most amazing people. And we have some incredible programs. You can go to partnersinracialjustice.org and check them out. There's always a roster, different kinds of programs. We have one called Oneness Chat. Uh, we have another program that is only for dark-skinned people called the Spirit of Blackness. And you might wonder, well, if your object is bringing all people together, why would you have that? Because uh, dark-skinned people have been underserved. They've been treated uh, in, in, unjustly. And there's a lot of suspicion, a lot of pain, a lot of trauma, understandably. And they need and deserve a place where they can explore things without the more uh, privileged class who will probably, unbeknownst to themselves, say things and whatever that are not going to serve the purpose of... Uh, it will not create an environment where somebody can really grow. Let's just say it that way. And so, uh, and then we have a black and indigenous led prayer circle, which is incredible. And we have other kinds of programs. Um, so what's going on with churches? Oh, well, okay. So as COVID lessened, we began to do things outside of uh, virtually. And we have a number of different things going on in Florida uh, that have emerged in in Savannah, Georgia, and now in North Carolina. Homer and I moved here about 18 months ago, and it's an amazing community here. There was all small community, but there was already a lot of trust building and relationship building. And so we had an opportunity to say, hey, let's try an experiment. Let's see if we could bring folks together and we talked to pastors that we were all, that folks were already in relationship with, and they said, "Yeah, we like that idea." The leadership, the pastors of of black, predominantly in the South, many many churches are predominantly black and predominantly white. That's just a reality of it. What if we could bring together the pastors and the congregants who want to to come together? We do it in the black church spaces because. For a long time, I think black people have known, have felt that, you know, we're always being asked to go to white spaces, right? Like nobody wants to come to our. So that's as a sign of respect and just as, you know, good sense. We, our primary demographics is everybody, but the most important demographics are African Americans, indigenous Americans, and youth and young adults of all backgrounds, okay? And it has an impact. It has an effect. And we've been doing it for a year. We have an extraordinary program director, Dr. Charles Bullock. And he, you know, he creates the programs. And the, and the team um, consults. And if the team makes a decision, the board makes a decision to tweak this or whatever, everybody is, is for that. But we don't really need to do much of that because Charles on his own is a force of nature. So we began doing that, and it's just been an incredible year. You know, the pastors have been so hospitable. They've brought food. They have opened up their venues. They have invited uh, their congregants to come and inv to invite other people. One of our pastors, Pastor Larry Neal, you know, he made the comment once in one of the gatherings, if we're not doing this work, we're not doing God's work. The Baha'i vision is the oneness of mankind. The vision of beloved Jesus Christ is we're all brothers and sisters. It's the same thing. This is just a new context. At the time of Jesus Christ, we lived and died within 30 miles of where we were born. We thought the world was flat. If you said otherwise, there's a good chance you'd be burned at the stake as a witch or what have you, right? But today, the effective extrapolation of Jesus Christ's teaching in a world that is one neighborhood where you can get from one part of the world to the other in less than a second, in a nanosecond, and where travel, which used to be, you know, just on land, right, or sea, took forever, you can get very quickly from one part of the world. Quick communication, quick travel, the world is a neighborhood, 
the extrapolation of the truths of Jesus Christ have to find their way into the oneness of the entire human race. It's just pure logic. It's not rocket science. And that is our common ground. And they love the programming. There's a lot in the Baha'i writings about oneness. Even about, uh, even in the early 1900s, the early 20th century, um, loving teachings about dark-skinned people as the pupil of the eye of humanity through which the light of truth shines. And there's all kinds of implications for that. But also, you know, the oneness of mankind, it's, it's replete with it. You don't find that in the other religious scriptures. Why? Because it wasn't the time for that. You can't have the oneness of mankind if you don't have quick communication and quick travel. If you've never met people at another part, you, you know, don't, you've never been there. There's no connection, right? You can love your neighbor as yourself, and you can be commanded by the prophets of God to do that, but this is a whole new age. So um, now we are moving forward from just the churches to the wider community. We just did a, an amazing Race Amity Day celebration. Uh, we had a letter from President Joe Biden encouraging and supporting our work mentioning partners in racial justice uh, as an example of the kind of work that needs to be done. We're not the only people that are doing this. We were blessed to have that letter. It will help us in different ways. And uh, we're also taking this to new communities where there are folks that have the passion that want to, you know, that want to engage. We're developing material based on the programs that we've already done and input from those who have been part of the programs whether creating or participating. We're creating a syllabus. We're going to be doing training, both live, depending on the location, and virtually. And uh, we're excited about it. Where can people go if they want to get involved? They can go to partnersinracialjustice.org, and they can connect. They can also they can volunteer. Um, so, so visit our website. You can also write to us at info at partnersinracialjustice.org and just write in the subject line, reach out. Like we have board members, we have other collaborators that really understand what we're doing, either by Zoom or by phone, by email, whatever you'd like. We are there and this is our passion and this is what we do. That sounds amazing. I hope people get connected, get involved, and I want to say thank you to you for sharing all your valuable insights, wisdom over the years, first in business and then in this work, and really raising up communities and building capacity. So may I just say one thing to you? <laughs> you may. Um, I want to thank you for, and I know you feel like you're learning and you are a natural for this. You're amazing. I, 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 you've told me you're going to give me a copy of this. I've never had time. But more than that, I don't know, you've opened something up. My kids have said, you've got to, you've got to write a book. I, I probably will never do that. I just don't have time. <laughs> all, all this other stuff is more important than that. This is on the ground stuff. But uh, they're going to love this recording uh, I've done a lot of interviews and things like this. I'm not saying this about my, this is the best conducted interview I've ever been in. Well, thank you. And I wish you all the best. Thanks for listening to this conversation with David Hoffman. And now let me leave you with some words from the Baha'i writings. Oh, brethren, let deeds, not words, be your adorning. Thank you for listening, and I hope to see you next time.